From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Thanks for joining us. If you're not already a subscriber, please be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. And please kindly leave us a nice review. This week, the 2022 midterm elections are just about in the books with the result of the Senate runoff in Georgia. Incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock defeated the Republican candidate, the former football star, Herschel Walker. Now, Walker had been backed, of course, by former President Donald Trump, and his defeat completed a pretty remarkable string of losses for candidates across the country who had endorsed Trump's claim that the 2020 election was stolen. In fact, the result in Georgia means that for the first time since 1962, Democrats made gains in the Senate in the midterm elections while they controlled the White House. So what happened? Was Trump to blame? Or, as some Republicans have begun to argue, is there a wider leadership problem for the party in the Senate, the House, and the Republican apparatus itself? Did Mitch McConnell, Senate minority leader and other leading figures in the party, fail to support candidates like Walker with enough energy and financial support? Well, to talk about the lessons of the elections, I'm joined this week by Senator Rick Scott, Republican of Florida. Scott beat an incumbent Democrat to win election to the Senate in 2018, having previously served two terms as Florida's governor. Last month, he challenged Mitch McConnell for leadership of the Senate Republican caucus. Now, he was beaten back comfortably by the incumbent, but he vowed to continue to press for change in the Republican Party. So to talk all about that now, Senator Scott joins me. So we saw the results of the Georgia Senate runoff this week. Republican Herschel Walker lost to the incumbent Democrat, meaning that the Democrats have actually managed to gain a seat in the Senate. What's gone wrong for Republicans in these midterm elections? Is it Donald Trump or is it something else? Well, first off, I'm very disappointed, um, as you expect. I thought we would get a majority. Actually, I thought we'd get maybe 52. Here's where I think we have to really think about this. One, we have to go back and do an assessment. And so I've been talking to, and I'm going to continue to talk to people that were involved in these races, because every race is not a national race. It's what's going on in that state. And it's between two people at the time. So yeah, we always have to put that in perspective. But I think the one thing we have to do is we can't get behind. A lot of states have added mail-in ballots and more early voting. In Florida, we've learned how to do that. Actually, my races, I've had one primary and three general elections in Florida. And so I do well with early voting and mail-in ballots. And we've got to do that. That's one thing. I think the other thing is I believe is that we have to be known for fighting to make Washington work for American families. Think about this for a second. How can what is something like 70% of Americans think the country's on the wrong track and we not have more wins? I think we have to start fighting as Republicans of what are we going to get done? And so I put out a plan. It doesn't have to be my plan. I put out a plan. You can go to rescueamerica.com. But I think we have to say to Americans, if you vote for a Republican, by the way, the reason I believe this is this is how I ran my election. I told people, I said, it's real simple. If you want X, you should vote that way. If you want why, you should vote this way. And I think that's what we got to make clear. If you want somebody that's going to focus on reducing inflation, then you shouldn't vote for a Republican. If you want somebody that's going to reduce a crime, yeah, you should vote a Republican. If you should want somebody that's going to secure the border, you should vote Republican. If you actually like inflation, if you like bigger government, don't vote for a Republican. That's not us. But Senator, that message was, I think, pretty clear, wasn't it? In the mid Are you saying that somehow... Voters were confused about whether Republicans really were going to do something about inflation or crime or immigration. I thought that was really very much, as you just said, with the president is enormously unpopular at the moment. The Republican Party had tremendous political advantages. I thought that was pretty clear. Why didn't voters like that message? Well, first off, I think one thing we got to do is we have to keep talking to the people that were involved in each state race because it wasn't just one national race. It wasn't a presidential race. It was an individual. But I think Republicans have to be known for fighting and when we have the opportunity to be in power, get things done. But think about it. Can you say to yourself that, oh, gosh, Republicans are really, really against debt? When let's look at times that we've been in a position of power, the national debt's gone up. Are we really in for balanced budgets when Republicans have voted not for balanced budgets? We've got to say to ourselves, if we actually really, really believe in these things on debt, we ought to be a brick wall then. On balanced budgets, we got to be a brick wall. I think we have to tell people, how are we going to solve these problems? So I think we did a good job of telling people how bad the Democrats are. I think but we have to do a better job of saying, that's great, they're bad, and this is what we're going to do to make it better. And I don't think we did a good enough job doing that. But I mean, in some 
cases. The Republicans did extremely well, most notably, obviously, your colleague, Ron DeSantis, won re-election as governor of Florida in a huge landslide. And in the process, one helped to win, I should say, several House seats in Florida, which probably between them and, say, New York, another state where Republicans did extremely well. So the message, it was a mixed picture, wasn't it, nationally? And isn't it surely the case that as you look at those results, the ones where Republicans did extremely well with strong candidates, and you look at results, particularly Senate seats that really should have been Republicans for the taking, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, probably, weren't these all cases of candidates who were for whatever reason, and we can go into that, weren't able to succeed. And Georgia's a really interesting case in point. Herschel Walker lost that race by three points to Warnock, while incumbent governor Brian Kemp, Republican, won by seven or eight percentage points. All the other statewide races in Georgia went Republican, except for Herschel Walker. Doesn't that say something about both the candidate themselves and the fact that they were endorsed by and in return endorsed Donald Trump's claims about the 2020 election? First off, Many of our candidates went through a lot of primaries. We had 21 Republicans up, and there are only 14 Democrats. So our candidates went through a lot of tough primaries. You look at Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, I think something like $54 million worth of ads against him in the primary. So you look at somebody like that, and you'd say, was he a good candidate? I'd say, yeah. I mean, here's a world-renowned physician, top healthcare talk show host in the world. I'd say, that's a pretty good candidate. You look at Herschel Walker, and you'd say to yourself, here's a guy that was Heisman Trophy winner, successful athlete, and on top of that, a successful business person. He's built a very good business, right? And he's done a lot with the military. But you look at, you know, Warnick had more money. He's an incumbent. I think if you look at the people that ran, I mean, Adam Laxall was a successful attorney general in, in Nevada. I think we had good candidates. And here's the other thing we have to acknowledge. The voters get to decide. You know, every state's different. You look at the U.S. Senate. And you look, this is a people from a variety of backgrounds. And when I ran in 10, I was not the establishment candidate. I was running against a 22-year congressman, I think it was, sitting attorney general. And everybody didn't know me, so I was a bad candidate, right? Because they, they didn't know me, even though it didn't matter that I had success in business. But because I had never had success in running a race, that I was not the best candidate. So if you look at the background of the people that were running, they're great people. It's just, look, they had primaries and you got to learn how to run a race. It's hard. I tell all the candidates when they get in and say, look, I'm happy you're in. I wish you the best of luck. You have to do it all. You have to run a campaign. You have to build volunteers. You have to have the right message. You have to do debates. You have to do TV appearances. You have to, have to just work your butt off for the time of this race. And I said, there's no guarantees because you got an opponent that might have more money than you. So taking Herschel's case, I think Warnock, as an incumbent, had three times as much money. Stacey Abrams didn't have three times as much money as Brian Kemp, and Brian Kemp was the incumbent. So I think that we had good candidates. I think that, you know, we've got to learn how to do a better job with early voting, with mail-in ballots. we got to do, we got to be known for, these are the, we say we're the, for these things. Are we really for these things? Are we going to fight like hell for these things? And I think if we do, I think we're, we're going to win. Just to be clear, then, I mean, I'm sorry to keep pressing this point, but you, so you, just to be honest, you don't think that there was a negative Trump factor at all in, in this election. You think it was all these these other issues, you know, that you've laid out to do with fundraising, to do with I've not seen organization. You don't see a negative Trump effect at all in the midterm. Is that correct? You know, he wasn't on the ballot. I mean, here's why I look at all these. Forget Trump just, just for a second. In 2010, I had almost no endorsements. I got into the race in April with a primary in August and during election in November, my opponent had every Republican in the country endorsed him. So I would go to a debate and my opponent would list off his endorsements and I would talk about the issues that were important to Floridians and that's how I won. So I think people, if it's a race that nobody knows about, like you know what happens in Florida and probably happens around the country is that there's a lot of races that people don't know anything about. So take it like a local judge's election. But these Senate races and government races, people get known. I mean, there's money and a lot of articles written about them. So I could tell somebody that, oh, in, in the local race, I live in Naples, Florida. I know these people in my experience working with them. I might have an influence on people, but as a general rule, these people get known. There's so many ads run against in these governors and Senate races. I've not seen any polls to suggest it. So I think it's about two people running and who's got the best message for that race. 
We've got to take a short break there, but when we come back, I'll have more on the future of the Republican Party with Senator Rick Scott of Florida. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm talking with Senator Rick Scott of Florida about the future of the Republican Party. Talk about Florida if we can. Obviously, as you say, you served two terms as governor. Ron DeSantis was elected narrowly in 2018 and then with a landslide this time around and does seem to have turned what's been a swing state for many, many, many years, at least possibly into a solidly red state, especially with all those wins in the House. Tell us if you would give us your sense of what's going on there and why in this particular set of midterms, why the Republican Party has been so successful. Well, when I ran in 10, there are 4.9 million Democrats and 4.4 million Republicans. And I won re-election because they felt comfortable. I did what I said I was going to do. And that was very specific. I had a seven-step plan for 700,000 jobs because people forget back in 2010, we had 1.1 million homes in foreclosure. We were losing people. They're leaving the state. When people left, they moved in. We had almost a million people on unemployment. Economy was in shambles. And then I won the Senate. And I think in 2018, I was the only person that won in 18 in a swing state in the Senate in the country. And I think I won because people got to know me in eight years. They thought I'd you know, I did what I said I was going to do because it wasn't a good Republican year. If you look at now as compared to those elections, even in 18, there are 4.9 million, I think, Democrats in the state and 4.7 million Republicans. Now there's 5.2 million Republicans. I think that there's a lot of people that, one, change parties because they want to vote in, in a primary. And two, we have a lot of new people coming into the state. They like lower taxes and less governance. So, and I think they think that Republican governance in Florida has worked. And so you guys still have to run your race and do a good job. But I think it's a Republican state now, just like other states have changed, like Missouri and Ohio is. I think a lot of it is people have come to the conclusion that in those states that Republicans are doing a better job. And there's a clear difference between Republicans and Democrats in those states. Do you think Ron DeSantis should be the next president of the United States? Oh, I'm not getting involved in the 24 election. I think there's going to, you know, a lot of people I'm sure are going to run and you know, we'll see what the issues are in the country in 23 and 24. And here's what I tell people on who ought to have jobs. I think we should look at elections as job interviews. And so I got elected in 10 to solve the problems of 2010. If I wanted to run again, I had to say, what are the issues in 2014 and 2018? And now 24 for my reelection to the Senate is, am I the right person to solve the problems of that cycle? And that's how we should think about who we elect. And then we ought need to hold people accountable. But I think it's we're hiring somebody to solve the problems of the day. You challenged Mitch McConnell for the leadership of the Republican caucus in the Senate. You lost, but it was the first challenge to McConnell, I think, in 15 years as Senate Republican leader. What is it that you think is not right with the Republican leadership? What have they got wrong? What, what do you want to change? Well, you know, what I ran is I believe we can't cave into the Democrats. We're going to be 51-49. To pass legislation up here, they have to get nine of our votes for legislation. Unless they want to abolish the filibuster. Yeah, that's a decision they get to make. There's nothing I can do about that. But I think we can't be caving in. We're at $31 trillion of debt. We have to say to ourselves, we're going to become a brick wall. Mm -hmm. One thing nice about the Senate is you have a lot of opportunities to fight here. And I think we ought to take every opportunity. I think there are countries in deep trouble. I ran in 2010 for governor, and I ran in 2018 for the Senate because I think our country's in trouble. I'm the luckiest kid alive. Grew up in public housing, born to a single mom. I grew up in a country where my mom could tell me legitimately that I could be anything, and I've tried. So I got to build businesses. I've led the dream of this country. I want that dream for every person in this country. So what I think we ought to be doing is, let's be a brick wall to this government spending. Let's be a brick wall to get in our budget balance. Let's be a, a brick wall to some of these crazy radical ideas. I've completely opposed the CHIPS bill because there's no accountability. The infrastructure bill, there's no accountability. And I think we ought to work as a team to do it. I mean, this is a team sport, so you got to bring people together. So I just think that we ought to be known as the fighting Republicans. Do you blame McConnell or the party in some way in terms of organ? There has been a lot of criticism organizationally. You mentioned things like early voting, Republicans not doing enough of that, maybe some of these fundraising gaps that you have. Is that a problem right now with the leadership of the party? Is that something that needs to be addressed? I think that what my mom told me growing up is that everything that happens 
you should take responsibility for. And the only way you're going to change is by saying, what can I do better? So I think all of us at every level have to say ourselves, how do we excite people to get out to vote? How do we excite people to be donors? How do we excite people to be volunteers? How do we excite people to have great people run for office? And I think that's what we have to do. And so, you know, look, I don't look at life as that as you blame other people. I look at life as say, okay, so this didn't work out exactly the way I wanted. I want to act like Ulysses S. Grant in Vicksburg. Okay. That didn't work out the way I wanted, so I'm going to try something different. I think we ought to try to be very aggressive on what we believe in, and that's what I plan on doing. I am going to fight like hell for the things I believe in, and if I'm not, I mean, I'm not being honest with the people that sent me here. I was clear. If you go back to when I ran in 18, and I'll be clear you know, when I run in 24, is that this is what I'm going to try to do, and I can go home and say, Hey, you know what? This is what I tried. This is what worked. And this is what didn't work. And that's why I put out my ideas. I put out my ideas at rescueamerica.com. And I told everybody, those are Rick Scott's ideas. They're not the Republican Party's ideas. But you know what? I hope everybody puts out ideas out and let's fight over ideas. If I can't convince you, that's my problem, not your problem. Obviously, the Republican Party underwent a dramatic change in 2015, 2016 with Donald Trump's candidacy kind of came from essentially sort of outside the party, really out of the blue and completely transformed, disrupted the party and transformed it. Do you think as people digest these election results, and I know obviously you disagree, but a lot of people are blaming, if you like, Donald Trump for the result, saying that things have gone off track in the last couple of years. Do you think there's a danger that the party is slips back or indeed is being led back into its kind of pre-2015 mold with its being much less, for want of a better word, much less populist, much more in favor of those sort of traditional conserv- Reagan conservative ideas that seem to dominate the party for so long and that, that Trump came along and essentially disrupted. Is the Republican Party struggling to get back to its sort of pre-Trump condition? You know what I think is going to happen? I mean, we're going to have a spirited presidential race, right? We're going to have primaries, on our side, at least, I don't know if the Democrats will. And we're going to have a fight over the best ideas for where this country is going to go. I'm excited about what's going to happen because I like trying to fight over ideas. I came into this with my ideas. When I ran in 10, my idea was that if you want to have more opportunities for kids like me growing up, what you have to do is you have to have a better economy. You have to have more freedom. You have to have more opportunity. And guess what? When you do that, You have more money for education, more money for transportation, more money for the environment, which is what happened. And I cut taxes and fees 100 times. I cut the regulation, regulatory environment, cut the permanent environment. And guess what? My revenue skyrocketed. I could spend more money. I think what we have to do as Republicans is we have to go show people that what our path is better for them. And if we don't, we won't win. So I think the next two years is going to be an exciting time for the country because we're going to have a real conversation. Do you want to have more big government, more top-down people telling you how to lead your lives, or do you want to have more individual opportunity with an organic economy that's built by individuals having the opportunity to live the dream that they want? I think Americans want more freedom and more opportunity, and they don't need more government because what they're getting out of this is inflation. This is unbelievable. I mean, just staggering, wasteful spending, either both by Congress and this complete misallocation by Jay Powell at the Federal Reserve with the balance sheet is going to cause unbelievable problems for Americans through inflation and through when the balance sheet gets corrected, which it always has to, right? People are going to be furious that people went along with this. The final question, Senator, obviously perhaps the big change that's come over the Republican Party in the last few years, again, you know, we can put it to Trump or or other factors, but it's very much become more of a working class, middle class, working class party. You know, there's been almost this kind of strange inversion of the two parties. People used to think of Republicans as kind of the party of sort of the elites and big business. And now it seems as though the Democrats are the party of the kind of establishment and the elites. And the Republican Party is a sort of almost like an insurgent party of the working classes, by the way, also at the same time, making significant inroads into minorities like Hispanics, particularly, but also even to some extent, African-Americans. How does that change the party's agenda and what you as a Republican senator and your colleagues should be striving to do? Growing up in public housing, I always thought the Republican Party was the party for the people that were aspiring for success. That's how I always thought about it. So if you go back and look what I talked about when I ran, started running in 2010, that's what I talked about. I won the Hispanic vote 
in 2010, 2014, 2018, because I showed up, I spoke to the Hispanic community because I believe Hispanics are just like you and me. They're aspirational. They want their kids to get a good education. They want the American dream. They want to live in a safe community. They respect our military. They want our institutions to work. They believe in our constitution and they're here for a reason. And so I think what the Republican Party, the people that are voting with the Republican Party today is exactly what I think it should be. We should be the party of saying, you can be anything. One of the most fun things I did as governor, I'd go to grade schools and I'd say, hey, I just want to let you know, I don't know my dad. Never met him in my life. Never met my, my natural father in my life. I said, I had a wonderful mom. We lived in public housing. And then I'd go through, you know, do you want to be the governor? And then I would go through why they ought to be the governor. And by the end, I had every kid in there going to be running for a governor someday. Because that's what we ought to do. We ought to be the party that gives people hope where they can go. And it has to be truthful that they actually have this opportunity. So I'm excited about the future. Senator Rick Scott, there's going to be plenty more of these topics to discuss. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Free Expression. All right. Bye-bye. That's it for this week's episode of Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages. Thanks very much for listening. Please join us again next week as we take another deeper look at the issues that are shaping the news. Thanks very much and goodbye.